Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. It is finally a new year. 2020 was for many quite an upheaval. I know it felt like that to me, but now we have an opportunity to make the most of it, even though we're still in the midst of this thing. So in the spirit of trying to make the most of it, I thought it'd be a good idea to have one of my Zen masters that I trained under on this podcast. So please welcome Genpo Roshi. I've known Genpo Roshi for a number of years, and I've specifically been his student for maybe about six years. Genpo Roshi has been practicing and teaching Zen for over 50 years. He's actually the Zen master of two of my other Zen masters. And he's quite a Zen master. And unique to him is that he's blended this 50 years of practice with traditional Western psychotherapy to create something entirely new called Big Mind. And in the next few episodes, you'll get to see him put Big Mind into practice with my co-host, Ron Williams. So we'll talk about a great many things in this episode and upcoming episodes, things like what Zen actually is, who we are versus who we think ourselves to be, how our minds manufacture pain and suffering, and how to escape that, the opportunity that COVID provides us to find our our purpose in life, how to meditate, coming from a Zen master, and a whole bunch more. So please help me in welcoming Genpo Roshi. What what should we call you? Genpo or Genpo Roshi or Roshi? Either Genpo Roshi or Roshi. Okay, cool. So... You've been a Zen master for what, over 50 years? 54, is it? Well, no, no. I've been into Zen for 50 years. Uh-huh. Uh, I've been uh, what we would call a Zen master since 96. And 96. Uh, a Zen teacher since 1980, a sensei in 80. In 96, I became a Roshi, a Zen master. Okay. So 24 years and a teacher for another? Well, I've been teaching since the 70s, yeah. Uh, it's a long time. Yeah. So, you know, for le- listeners, I think Zen is pretty esoteric. I think in most people think it just means calm or something. So maybe you can tell the listeners what Zen is. And that might be a, a tall order. It might take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I think to make it simple, life. Life. Okay. It means your, it means your life. And it means your life. In, in the fullest sense of the word, in the, in the most integrous sense of the word, where you're whole, complete, at peace, free, liberated, and uh, yeah, a mess at the same time. So uh, <laughs> complete, whole, liberated, and a mess. At okay. the same time. All at the same time. So Life. I, I mean, think of life, right? Life, it's got it all, right? Yeah. Without life, we don't have any of it. So when we realize who we are, we realize we're this life and the whole of this life. In other words, we're connected to everything and everybody else. And we realize that. And then, so that's one phase of it. And then how do we love and appreciate all the differences? Because we're all very different. We're all quite unique and quite special. And sometimes we love that uniqueness of the other. And sometimes we hate it. And how do we appreciate uh, that we are all different, different colors, different sizes, different shapes, different mentality, different consciousness, all that. And then how do we appreciate that? You know, and how do we appreciate what's within us that we've never touched? We've never looked at. uh, We might be mystery to us or it might be a shadow to us. You know, we none of us can really see ourselves clearly. We can see our shadow. Or we see our reflection, but we don't see ourselves. So, how do we really appreciate ourselves, love ourselves, have compassion, but also for everyone else equally? Yeah, that's a that's a sum. Yeah. So, it, and I that starts to touch on how your Zen is mm-hmm. different than, say, a typical Zen, mm-hmm. um, to really start to understand yourself and, and the shadow mm-hmm. parts. Can you talk to us about that? Well, yeah. I mean. Normally, Zen practice uh, has to do with Zen meditation or Zazen, uh, as you know. I mean, that's how you started off in Zen, and and we sit a lot. 
And we can sit a lot, but we can actually sit on our junk, our crap, our, our stuff. You know, we can sit on it for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And we could have realizations, we can have openings and experience the oneness of life. We can experience the uniqueness of life. We can appreciate all that, but we still can remain assholes um, mm. because we have shadows. And so if I think I'm a very loving, compassionate person, which at one time I did think so, you know, then the shadow is I don't come out necessarily so loving and compassionate. I may come out as an asshole rather than as a loving and compassionate person. Now, I see myself as loving and compassionate, but it doesn't mean everybody else sees me that way. <laughs> and those are shadows. And so the big mind work was developed by me to complement normal Zen training, because Zen training, there was normally two big facets to Zen training, koan study, which are these unresolvable koan, uh, questions or puzzles, as you know, that can't not be uh, realized with the conceptual analytical mind, but, and not that the conceptual analytical mind is not important, <laughs> essential, but there's another mind that's much, much bigger. It's not limited by concepts. It's not limited by uh, rational mind. It's way beyond that. We call it the mind, a big mind, or, uh, you know, true nature, or true self, or true mind. And to appreciate that aspect of life, which is much more full, much more rich and complete than just analyzing and conceptual. So yeah. th that gets into something much bigger. Um, you know, I think most people would agree uh, that this year has been um, uh, tumultuous at, at the very least. At the very and, least. And, yeah. And, and very impactful for people. And I think um, a lot of people are questioning how they're living their lives right. and uh, uh, more specifically what's important to them. And I, I've heard in that context of what's important to me, you know, people are asking themselves like, what does my life mean? Or what's mm -hmm. the meaning of my life? Um, and I, I think that starts to, what you just talked about starts to get into the, the meaning of one's life. Um, I, I'm thinking of a quote. It was, yeah, Leo Tolstoy said, um, the greater the intellect, the less we understand the meaning of life. And you started to talk about the rational mind and something much bigger than that. I would just change that the less we realize that we understand, or the more we realize we don't understand, it's better. We, we realize how little we really understand. Like if you take all that any of us understand, and you can make the circle as big as you want, but somehow it'll fit within a circle. <laughs> It will fit within a container, all we understand. And then you take all that's beyond that container, all that's beyond that bubble, that circle, whatever you want to call that, is all that we don't understand, well, which is greater. I mean, no matter how much we understand intellectually and conceptually, it's such a small fragment of everything out there. So the more we understand, the clearer we are, the more we realize we realize that we really understand such a tiny bit. You know, I think Einstein said maybe, what, 20, 15, 20% of our brain we use. Uh, right. What about the rest of it? You know? Yeah. Zen allows us, I won't say to appreciate it all, but to appreciate it all as a whole. In other words, to know I don't know it all. I'll never realize it all. I'll never grasp it all. I'll never be able to figure it all out. But I can be it. Even though I cannot grasp the true mind, the big mind, right? Uh, I can actually be that. I just can't grasp it. It's just like the nose can't grasp the nose or the eyes can't see the eyes. Wow. That, that I, I think, well, so how do we get into um, people um, understanding the meaning of life? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, you can't. Right. You can't understand it because, as I just said, understanding is still conceptual and that's limited. So how do you understand all that is with a small little mind? But you can be all there is when you kind of mm -hmm. eliminate that which separates you from all there is. Well, what separates you from everything there is? Your thinking mind, thoughts. Mm. Before a thought arises, you're already connected. 
You've always been connected. You've always been one with the whole universe. There's no way not to be. I mean, we're nature. We're part of nature. We are nature. We're nature itself. You can say we're the world, and we've always been the world, but we don't see that we're the world because we divide everything up into self and other. What did Yamada Roshi say when uh, he said- Lots of uh, things. Uh, in <laughs> that book that we just read. In I'll the, tell the you class. what Yamada Roshi said to me just before he died. I was with him having a, a little scotch and a cigar, and he was 80-something, and I was 31 or so. And he said to me, you know, Gempo, until I turned 70, I did care what people thought and said about me. No, I don't give a shit. And it freed me. Huh. That's what Yamada Roshi said. <laughs> it, well, it may not be what you're thinking. Yeah, he also said uh, thoughts, concepts, opinions are, mm -hmm. are the, the, the suffering of... The cause of suffering of... Yeah. Cause of suffering of the yeah. human. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And, and so... Well, particularly, particularly the way we form our thoughts. It's not that thoughts are bad or thinking is bad. You know, in fact, one of the techniques I developed, I think it was about 2005 or six, uh, in the big mind process is to accept our thinking mind. You know, so often even in Zen, we make the thinking mind somehow wrong. And we think the thinking mind is causing all our suffering. Well, it is. But instead of pushing it away or suppressing it, imagine if you're a thinking mind and you're being repressed down in the basement without food and water, uh, without a window, uh, not having any communication with anybody. You're going to yell, scream. You know, that's what the thinking mind does because it's suppressed. The moment we love it, appreciate it, own it, empower it, allow it to speak, the thinking mind quiets down like a little kitty <laughs> it just starts purring <laughs> but it's a reverse psychology it's instead of pushing it away we invite it and the same with our suffering instead of pushing our suffering away invite the suffering because the moment you invite suffering and you say oh my god this is a lot of suffering can you handle more oh yeah i can handle more okay invite more then we invite more the moment we say i invite more we are bigger than the suffering itself we are opening ourselves up into a bigger, making a bigger container until we eliminate the container and we're just fast space and whatever comes in, comes in. It doesn't affect the mind. It never so I, did, but we think it does. I want and I feel like today, now more than ever, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the past 20 years since the first internet boom, things have gotten much faster, mm -hmm. much more complex. And it seems like we're in much more need of lifestyle management, mm -hmm. right? Eating better, exercise. And now I feel like meditation is right up there with eating well, exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I'd love to hear your point of view on that as well as Ron's point of view on, you know, meditation now becoming, you know, one of the top three uh, things you got to do to manage your lifestyle. Right. Well, first of all, let me say, if you think of the problem, let's say prior to COVID-19, if you think of, you know, we're all so busy running around. I mean, I was flying all over the world all the time, you know, uh, spending a lot of time in the air, a lot of time in the airports, a lot of time, you know, just traveling, a lot of time running to work and running back to, from work and, you know, all the things we were doing. And you think about, wow, it would be really nice to take a little retreat, right? Go off mm -hmm. to some monastery someplace. I'm sure you had those thoughts. I certainly did, you know. Uh, go off there and quiet down and find peace and all that. The world is getting that opportunity right now. We don't see COVID as an opportunity. We see it as an enemy, which is rightfully so. It, it's kind of attacking us all. But it's also always, you know, has a flip side. The other side of it, it's an opportunity for us to slow down, travel less, spend more time with our loved ones or alone, more time at home, more time in, in, in a kind of contemplative place. We still work. We're all working. Not all, but m many of us are working. You know, we're doing it digitally. And we're, thank God to the Internet and to Zoom and to all these uh, ways that we can connect with each other. But we're actually almost in a forced retreat. Mm. 
You can even call it a Zen retreat because some of the things that happen in a Zen retreat is you have to learn to slow down. You have to learn to sit quietly. You have to learn to be patient. You have to learn to give yourself to what you're doing because you don't have, you know, so much time. Most of the time you're on the cushion meditating. Uh, you, you have to learn to be patient. You have to learn to be persevere. You have to learn to kind of meditate. You have to learn to become a little wiser, you know? So we're, we're in an opportunity as a world right now. We're in retreat. Now, with any, any retreat, there's always going to be a time where each individual resists the retreat or rebels from the retreat or even wants to get out of the retreat and escape. It happens usually about the middle of a retreat, whether it's a week long or a year long. Around the middle, we just want to escape. And so there are a lot of us right now in this retreat mm. wanting to escape, get out of it, you know, and don't want to acknowledge that this is an opportunity of a lifetime. When this window shuts, and all windows shut, when this window called COVID-19 shuts, we're going to look back and say, wow, wow, that was incredible. Mm. What a time I got to know my partner. Like my sister and husband, they've been married 53 years, right? And I, I asked my sister oh, a few months ago, I said, well, how is it? You know, 53 years, you and John have been married. How is it? She said, well, I'm having to get to know him. <laughs> He's having to get to know me. You know? Yeah. We're just all the time together, right? 24-7. We're getting to know each other. We'll look back at that as just such a blessing. At some point, we will look back at this, you know, as a blessing in disguise that we got to be peaceful a lot. We got to quiet down, slow down, be in quarantine, and get to know our loved ones. And even through zoom you know like i have a granddaughter that now i've seen her but i had to wear mask the whole time now on zoom she's starting to interact with me she's about seven months old you know and even that is it's precious right just to have a zoom contact if you had asked me a year ago when you have a granddaughter that's six or seven months old and you're not going to be able to see her except for on zoom i would have been upset but now i just relish that opportunity just to see see her face without having a mask on so she can see my face you know so there's going to be lots of good things that we're going to appreciate about this once it's over so now that we set the context of the COVID-19 being an yeah. opportunity yeah how would you suggest one take advantage of that opportunity well I would say <laughs> The what you and I know as the six paramitas, right, are a really good, you could say, scaffolding uh, for how to protect it. What's the first paramita? Generosity, giving. And I think people have been very generous. I mean, a lot of people are really hurting. But, you know, there's certain uh, foundations, you know, like uh, one of the TV uh, news co commentators, I can't think of his name right now, uh, he follows Rachel Maddox. Anyways, he's get, he buys desks for kids in Africa. And he has this fund where he raises funds for. It. This year, he got more donations than ever before. Desks for kids in Africa. People somehow are getting in touch with their heart more. So it's an opportunity mm -hmm. to give, to, to give to others, to share. You know, we have an elderly lady who lives on our in our community down the hill a bit. And so we go down and visit her every day. She's got a son in prison. She lost her husband three years ago. She lost her sister a few months ago to COVID. And she had to have, you know, a uh, cataract. So we brought her to, actually Charlotte did, brought her to the doctor several times back. You know, we go down and see her every day. You know, we're all getting more generous because we have more space and time if we take advantage of it. The second, you know, is discipline. Well, we're all having to be mindful and disciplined. I mean, you got to really pay attention. If if you're smart and you don't want to catch it, and I'm 70, 80, I'm 76 years old, you know, it's supposed to be dangerous to catch it. So I have to be mindful. And we see how unmindful we are. We're constantly getting too close. We're constantly forgetting our mask. You know, get out of the car without the mask. And, oh, shoot, I got to get my mask. You know, the, 
opportunities to be mindful, opportunities to be disciplined, opportunities to go out and exercise. Like I like to go to the gym, but even now it's dangerous here in Colorado to go to the gym. So I have to get out every day and exercise. It's not easy. It's much easier to go to the gym and spend an hour and come back. So there's discipline involved. There's perseverance. It's the third part of me. Uh, right effort, right perseverance. How to, how to make the right effort in our life and, and maximize our time, you know, and energy. So right effort. Then patience. We have to be patient, you know. It will pass. Something is going to change forever. But we'll, we'll get back to some form of normalcy, you know. We will adjust to it. And so there's patience. And then it comes meditation. We all have an opportunity now to meditate, an opportunity to be quiet and learn how to be still and make peace with ourselves. And then wisdom, that's the six, you know, how to, how to really appreciate this life and to know what we can change and the value of that, know what we can, know how to appreciate who we're with, how to be with people we love and how not to be maybe with doing things and being with people that we don't want to be with and how to focus in our priorities and how to be wise about our decisions. So it's all right there. It's just an amazing time for us if we see it as an amazing time for us, an opportunity to practice. That's interesting. I, I saw a, there was a tweet just yesterday. And I've seen a few versions of it, but um, this, you know, this particular one got me thinking it was something like, I guess first a little backstory, um, you know, apparently Shakespeare wrote King Lear during a Black Death play. And I guess he left the, the city of London and went to the country. And, and that's how he spent his time. Right. And, and so we have this masterwork of, of, of a play out there. And, and so this guy tweeted, he's like, he's like, uh, wow, Shakespeare, you know, spent his playing time writing King Lear. I really feel like I've, I've screwed up the last year. Right. <laughs> like, and, and, and that got me thinking more about like, you know, you know, we're in this startup and, and Tony's actually helping with that too. And, and, and we put a lot of work in and, and, you know, trying to create something valuable, but I'm like, wow, did we, did we take full advantage of, of all this, you know, and, and, and sure, like you mentioned, there's time with family and there's, there's other pieces, but, but, you know, you know, or, or, you know, there's always the Elon Musk kind of comparison too, where, you know, this guy is on his way to being a trillionaire and, and there's a tweet um, maybe last week where someone said, you know, and here's, here's a picture, I think it was 1998 or something of Elon Musk repairing his old BMW, you know, and, and, and now he's got, you know, all this wealth later in, in Tesla's threatening BMW, right? And all this stuff. And it's like, you know, ne never, the point of the tweet was, you know, never question what a single individual can, how it can impact the world, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it seems like, you know, like I said, there is this opportunity and there's still opportunity. We, we are still in it and, and maybe we're only halfway through it even. Uh, that's right, that's right. You know, uh, so yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it is an opportunity. And it's really, again, how we appreciate life, the glass half full or the glass half empty. You know, this is an opportunity and we can just gripe and complain about it, you know, and be bitter and angry. Or we can see it as an opportunity to grow and evolve and develop, you know, it is. I mean, my wife and I, you know, she just finished her graduate program uh, for master's. And we said, well, after that, let's, this was before COVID, let's take three years and just do a retreat and invite other people to join us. And then I came up with this idea, well, let's do four years. So I started a four-year program. And this was more than a year ago, so we didn't know anything that COVID was coming. So we started, and Tony's part of that program, and we started this four-year program. Well, we're in retreat all the time. <laughs> you know, if it wasn't for the dog, we'd be just meditating all the time, but the dog gets us out <laughs> four times a day. <laughs> but then we get our exercise. We walk the dog and get our 10,000 steps in at least. You know? But it is an opportunity if we see it as that. I, I keep on bringing it back to meditation because sure. meditation is an access point for a lot of those things, discipline, perseverance, patience, but meditation is, is daunting and difficult for a lot of people. That's because they try to meditate. <laughs> what should they do? I think just sit and relax. Okay. Now, that may be hard for some people. 
So then you go to the next step. You have to accept that you're going to have thoughts. And start of, instead of fighting your thoughts, you know, the, the biggest thought, if you sit down to relax, is what you should be doing. <laughs> you know, I should be making the bed. I should be cleaning the house. I should be fixing the car. I should be shopping, you know, all these things. So you just let that run. Like, if you imagine, like, let's say you're a mirror, your mind's a mirror, and all these things come in front of it, they don't affect the mirror, and the mirror doesn't have to chase after them. You just let them come and let them go. Or you're the empty, vast sky. You just let these thoughts come and go, and you allow them. The key word is allow. Allow them to come and to go, and you don't chase after them, and you don't need to make a big deal about them. You don't even need to notice them particularly. You just sit there and relax. You know, I, I call my meditation now uh, old man's meditation. I just sit in a comfortable chair, like I'm in right now, and I just sit and I close my eyes. And I just sit there for an hour to two hours. And whatever happens, I, it happens. And then I find it goes so deep into what we call samadhi, as you know. It goes so deep. I don't want to stop. I don't even want to get up <laughs> because it's better than sleep. It's more delicious. And I use the word purposely. It's more delicious than just about anything. When you get into that quiet space, that peaceful state, space where you're just pure presence, you know, and you hear things and, and maybe uh, you have thoughts, but none of it really registers. You just let it be. You just let everything be. You find inner peace. Uh, we talked about that conflict ends. It and really it does. does. And does that sustain for the day or for to the next Well, session? it does affect your whole day and has some sustainability. Yes. Now, will it come back if you're a beginner? Sure, you'll come back and get very active and very, you know, all into that. So then that's a matter of practice. Uh, that takes time. I mean, I've been doing this 50 years. You know, next month will be exactly 50 years that I've been meditating this way. So, yeah, it takes time and patience, like we said, and perseverance. But it, it is sustainable. Like my wife says, and I don't remember when it stopped. She said, you know, this was about four years ago. She said, you're the first person I ever met that has no inner conflict. And I go, wow, yeah, you're right. I don't have any. And I don't remember when it stopped. But at some point along the line, I lost that inner conflict. That's from years and years of meditation. Then it's really sustainable. Once you really lose that inner conflict, you made peace with your, yourself, your life. Yeah. Ron, have you tried to meditate? Have I tried to meditate? Yeah. Not before today. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I, I have. It's, uh, it's hard. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of it may be just, you know, the way I'm wired or... Or, or some, uh, you know, long poor instructions. It's poor instructions. That's all. Poor, poor instructions. instructions. <laughs> so tell me, you taught me how to meditate. Just yeah. yeah. No, like, uh, and, and even Tony, I haven't worked on it much. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I, I, you know, I, I always wonder. I don't feel like I'm neurotypical kind of person, and so uh, there's a lot going on up there, right? Like a lot going on, and so. And it's not all bad. Um, it's just, um, you know, it's, it's like when I'm awake, uh, like, you know, I've got this, we got this little corgi puppy. It's not a year old, but it is the highest energy thing we, we've ever owned, like bounces off walls. It, it can run sideways along the, the side <laughs> of the couch, like not on the couch, but like, but runs along the it defies gravity, right. And runs along the edge of the couch. Um, it, it's so fast and energetic and the, uh, and, you know, a lot, that's the way my mind feels when it's awake, right? Like there's a, you know, it's a dynamo spinning stuff. And, and, and what I've learned, you know, from Tony uh, finally was, you know, how to, how to get pieces of it, how to slow it down. You know, if you imagine a spinning gyroscope and you could just reach in and just kind of slow it down enough so you can see what's going on and, and be more decisive about things and spend more time on something instead of switching, you know, uh, crazy rapidly. Um, I think you experienced uh, a slice of what uh, Gampo Roshi was just talking about as the benefits, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 And so I think Gampo was saying those are the benefits. They just happen for longer and more frequently. Yeah. More sustainable, you know, yeah. and, and it's, it's kind of odd because sometimes it's in retrospect. You know, you look back and you go, Oh my God, when did I 
feel so happy all the time or joyous or at peace or free or not concerned about this or that. You know, it, it kind of creeps up on you, you know, because certainly I remember times of conflict, but I can't even remember what it was all about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.